Welcome to the Alex Urbina Radio Show. The following is paid programming and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHS or its ownership. And good afternoon, Santa Clarita and everyone else streaming around the world on Facebook Live and in broadcast around the Santa Clarita Valley. Uh, you're welcome to the Alex Rubina Radio Show. We're live in the KHCS studio in beautiful downtown Newhall, California. I'm hanging out with my, co- my, uh, my board op, Andrew Delgado, and today we're going to be talking about um, why teenagers seem to be so difficult. And I want to open up a discussion and open up some possibilities as a parent. If you see your kids or your children or your teenagers as becoming difficult uh, to parent, or just having challenges with them, I just want to open up uh, some some dialogue. And so, what I what I did was I wrote down some things about looking at your perspective, right? So, could it be possible that you see your kids or your teenagers as difficult because that's how you see them? That's your current perspective. You've collected evidence that they're challenging, they're difficult, they're hard to uh, parent because of their behaviors, right? So the number one is, are you open to the possibility that that's how you see them and that you could possibly not see them like that if you learned how or if you trained yourself or you practice how to create a new perspective towards your children? Oh, yeah, that's definitely because it's, it's you have that whatever what came to mind was you might have that bad taste in your mouth from one instance or whatever, yeah, that preconceived notion that you have. And then you just stick with that. They can never change. That's right. And so, then you kind of look for that. Yeah. So let's say when they were little, uh, your first parenting model was that of a controlling style parent, right? You're the autocratic parent where when they were little, you just told them what to do and they did it because they don't know any different. They don't have a mind of their own. They don't, they don't have an ability to think for themselves. So by, as a byproduct, they're just going to follow your lead because naturally you're their leader from age three mm-hmm. to five to probably about six or seven when they start realizing that they can think for themselves. That's where this starts to become a little more challenging, right? So if you're that parenting style, that of a controlling style parent, the awareness and the awakening to now transition into parenting teenagers in a more effective way is the parenting style that much of a coach or a mentor where you learn how to inspire or um, enroll or – you know, support them in a different way in your parenting style. Most parents don't transition. They don't learn a new parenting style. So they stay in that controlling style parent. So now your son or daughter's 16 or 17, and you're still trying to muscle them into doing the things that they used to do when they were five years old. Yeah, and then that's why you get that pushback. Like, that's right. Yeah. And so it's just natural. It's a natural yeah. phenomenon for kids, uh, teenagers, to go through this uh, state where they uh, realize – that they are competent and they're confident and they can start to think for themselves and they want to start making their own choices for themselves. And that's where that natural budding heads comes in, right? Not to mention that they have created stories about you, mom and dad, that might not necessarily be real, but it's real for them. And the stories might sound like you're never there for me or uh, you know, you contradict yourself, you say one thing and then you don't follow through or I can't trust you or all these uh, b- beliefs that they have um, inside this parent box that you're trying to fight out and get outside of because whether they put you there fairly or unfairly, you're in a box. And so now you're struggling with trying to work cohesively with your teens and still be that leader that you used to be and you're, and you're struggling, <laughs> right? Yeah, and the thing is, parents, that you – Yes, you're going to help have your teen change, but you have to change. You can't expect change from somebody else. You, you know what I'm like trying to say? Because, yeah, after that so long, you, you've been doing this, drilling this for so long, you can't expect somebody else to change and, and think how you want them to act if you're not changing yourself. And, that, and that's true about the, parent, the, about the teenagers in today's world. In today's world, the teens, they're demanding that the parent change, grow, learn, evolve, discover, reinvent themselves. When I was growing up in that era, your, the parents didn't need to change not one bit because they parented more from a controlling style parent model. They were, it was fear-based parenting. They, they instill yeah. fear in you. 
and they could drive that all the way until you're 40 or 50 years old. I still know I still know some of my friends that are 40, 50 years old, and their parents <laughs> still still um, parent them from that fear-based parenting, and it still works. But yeah. to, but today's kids, that that model doesn't work anymore. Uh, you, all you're doing is pushing no. them away and and having them um, try to get away from your house and not want to be around you. Uh, the fear-based parenting model seldom works. I'm not gonna say it doesn't work for everybody because there are some kids that um, they still respect their mom because or their dad from that fear-based parenting model. But you always have that one family where they'll say, it worked with my one son, it didn't work with my daughter. <laughs> or it worked yeah. with all two of my first kids, but not the youngest one. Or they always have that one mm -hmm. kid that's going to be the challenge. But it's today's kids that's challenging us, us as parents that we have to keep evolving. We have to keep discovering new levels um, and higher levels of parenting. And it requires us to and demands for us to evolve. And, and learn some interpersonal tools. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to paint this picture. And, and again, we go back to the title of the of this show, which is why teenagers seem to be so difficult. So for number one, they, they could possibly seem to be difficult because that's how you see them. From your current perspective, you've created a story that, oh, my God, my son is so difficult. And it's probably even in some of your venting or some of you are complaining to your to your mom yeah. or to your to, to people. You you start off with, oh, my daughter's so so difficult. Or you're complaining to the therapist or the counselor. It's already in your it's in your words. It, you've already put them in that box that they're difficult. And I got to tell you, if you've already created that belief that your kids are difficult, well, guess what? They're going they're to gonna be, be difficult. They're going to yeah. be difficult because that's how you see them. That's the start off point. And as long as you see them as difficult, you're going to keep manifesting the difficult and the challenges that are that are extreme when it comes to your son or daughter. So that's number one, that you see them as difficult. So now let's go over why uh, and some of the evidence you would have collected that has you see them as difficult from your eyes. So, so number one would be possibly that they no longer agree with me, so therefore I see them as difficult. Number two... Uh, I see them that they no longer listen to me uh, the way that they used to, which would have you see them as difficult. Number three, they no longer do as I say or go along with some of the instructions or the requests that I give them. So you see them as difficult. Yep. Number four, they no longer respect me. Number five, they no longer trust me. And, I, and the reason why I say they no longer is because at one point they did. Yeah, that you were everything you were you were the king you were their yeah. queen you were their god and all of a sudden something changed right number six they believe that they know better and that they have all the answers when they don't right that's how you currently see it and so that becomes they show up as difficult to you number seven they believe that they have life all figured out when they don't and so that's that's a big one yeah. difficult right it's difficult for you to wrap your head around that number eight they deliberately do the opposite of what I've suggested or advised. Yeah, that's, they, a, yeah. that's a difficult child. Number nine, they argue with me when I'm only trying to help them. They would, they would appear to you as being difficult. And number 10, they don't communicate with me. They shut down. They check out. And so when that, when that happens, it becomes difficult uh, to parent you. And so therefore, you're a, a difficult uh, teenager, um, difficult child for me. So those are all some of the reasons, not all the reasons, but it's right. some of the reasons that would have you believe this theory, this belief, this paradigm that my son or daughter is very difficult. Now, so I already pointed out the possibility that that's how you see them and you've created evidence and you probably have good reason and, and you've justified that all these reasons are great reasons to say this is how difficult my child is. Now, what if you were able to learn and discover a whole different perspective, a whole new lens to look through, a different pair of glasses to see your kids through. And that was the responsible version of your parenting. And you were willing to be honest and take accountability of the responsible version of the part that you've contributed, the part that you play, maybe the part that you have fallen short, or the things that you haven't learned, or things that you've never been taught. What if we jumped into that perspective and we were able to speak from that place? It would sound different. Oh, completely different. And so what, yeah. So what I did was I threw out some contrast. So if we go over number one, which is they no longer agree with me. 
Right. If okay. we change that to, I have yet figured out how to get them to see my point of view. Does, okay. that, does that change scenarios? That, that changes scenarios in, well, coming from the younger side, like I don't have kids, so I'm more towards the, you the can teenager take the, side. You can take this with any human being. Right. Anyone that no longer agrees with you. Listen, I mean, for you, you don't have yeah. to put it, try to put it in a parent box. Okay. But parents, you're listening, just see your son or daughter in yeah. front of you. If you operate from the, the lenses, my son or daughter no longer agrees with me versus I've yet figured out how to get them to see my point of view. It's a whole different perspective, one that's more powerful than the blaming one. Because the blaming one is, oh, my, it's like a whining, complaining. Right, you come in, you sit yeah, down okay. with your therapist. Yeah, you go, the... my kid, no, you know, my kid no longer agrees with me. Okay, so that's their come from where it's rather you're not agreeing. Why aren't you agreeing with me? Rather than the other side, which you just said was, let me try to get you to agree with me. No, no, you're it's, no. They're, you're just flat out saying I ha you're acknowledging that I haven't, as a parent, I haven't figured out how to get you to see my point of view. Okay, got it. So let's say you and I are in a discussion, and you're just not agreeing with me. Right. When you walk out of the room, I can look to someone, you know, in the room and I go, man, he's difficult. He, he doesn't agree. He doesn't. Okay. He doesn't, so then, yeah, he doesn't get it. So you put that difficult like, oh, he's just difficult. It's just That's you. Done. You're, you're difficult. Right. You're a difficult person because you don't agree with what I'm trying. You never agree with me. Yeah. Now, if I look to that person, I say and she says or he says, man, Andrew's uh, man, he's difficult. He never agrees with anything we say or you say. And then I correct him. I go, no, no, no. It's not about Andrew. I haven't figured out yet how to get Andrew to see what I'm – the point I'm trying to make. Okay, now, boom, clear. Light bulb just went <laughs> off. Got it. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's me owning the responsible version. Yeah. And so what most parents do is they blame their kids. That they put that difficult box their, on them. Their yeah, child is this way like it's, like it's set in stone and that they can't do nothing about it. Rather than if I learned uh, how to communicate a little bit more effectively, if I learned how to be more creative in, in enrolling people into seeing value – if I learned how to um, be more empowering and more inspiring, uh, learn how to articulate words so that I can really have my son or daughter uh, see whatever I'm trying to get them to see in five different ways, ten different ways, then I'm more, then I'm more um, successful in getting them to agree with some of the concepts that I'm trying to teach them rather than just deciding that you're just difficult because you never agree with right. me. And that's, then, the yeah, easy, and that's what everyone does. That's the easy out. Because it's just – it's easy out because then you're just done. Yeah. And you just, label like, yeah. I'm just and done nothing, with you. Nothing That's I can it. do. I need now to go to a therapist or psychologist or a coach or somebody to say, hey, fix my kid. She's difficult. Right. Rather than put in, you know, some extra work and then you'll get there. Yeah. No one wants to put so, extra work. You right? know that. It's just easy enough <laughs> to say, oh, you're difficult. And just yeah. Done. So number two, number two, they no longer listen to me the way that they used to versus I've yet figured out how to get them to hear what I'm saying. It's like, like it's an art form. Mm -hmm. Like getting somebody to really hear what you're saying takes practice, and it's an art form. Just like right now on the radio, there's a lot of people that don't agree with me. They can't hear me. Uh, what I'm saying is challenging for them to, to comprehend. But through the years of opening up possibilities or using certain words to say it in a way that lands for, for most people to hear, I'm able to get people to really think and go, hmm, I never thought about it like that. That's a certain ability that you have to practice. It takes a, a big commitment, and you got to really put some effort in to saying things in a certain way that, that more and more people can see it and go, I can see that. You don't necessarily have to agree with me. I just want you to be able to hear what I'm saying. And so a lot of teenagers won't even listen to their parents. As soon as they hear the third word, they tune out. But what would it look mm -hmm. like if you learned how to articulate yourself and put words together so it sounded uh, more neutral, more inviting, um, it was it was more in a way that uh, wasn't making them bad and wrong, and it was like an invitation for them to just try it on. Then then you've developed a really um, amazing tool to have discussions with your kids that had them start to think, rather than just tuning you out and getting parent deaf. Because that's what mm -hmm. a lot of kids do; they just get parent deaf. Yeah, because um, from that or, or talking with somebody, usually the parents that come from that controlling and saying this is my way, do it this way, and then the kids. So sometimes, but they either say, "But how about?" And then, and then the parents say, "No." And then, like, okay, then I'm just. And then the next time, they're just not going to listen. Yeah, or because they've already created a new belief that you don't listen to me, anyways. Rather than yeah. no, I want to hear what you say. Let's let's have this dialogue. Let's talk about this. 
let's let's agree to disagree. Let's challenge each other. Yeah. And and get into a healthy conversation where maybe possibly you know what, son, you maybe you could teach me something. Maybe you can open up my eyes to see something that I couldn't see. And so it really you know points to to having you look at do you see the perspective where you have decided that your kids no longer listen to you rather than choosing the perspective that I still haven't figured out how to get you to hear what I'm saying. And I haven't developed that art yet, that, 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 the way of articulating myself so that I can plant seeds or at least get you to start to question it rather than having you just tune me out. Yeah. And I would say if you just run that through your head, like you can say, Oh, you listened to me, but did you hear me? That's right. Kind of deal. That's and right. Then go back and forth. Yeah. And you get somewhat better off from that. So number three is, uh, they no longer do as I say um, or go along with any of the instructions or the requests because they used to do that. When they were younger, you would just tell them, hey, as soon as you're done with that, come outside you know, or whatever. You gave them instructions and they would just do it yeah. because you were the leader and they were your follower. But when they start to have their own mindset, they start to have a think for themselves, they start to go, hmm. Maybe I like, might. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'm my own leader, and then that's, yeah. that's when they start to now push back mm-hmm. and those kinds of things. So they used to be able to do as you said, and they used to go along with your instructions or requests. Now they're challenging them, which has them seem difficult to you. But if you change your glasses and put on the glasses and look through the filters of, um, I've yet figured out how to influence them at this stage, or inspire them to do the things that I believe will work for them. So now it puts it puts it in your in your lap the responsibility of the communication, the um, the responsibility of getting them to see the value, um, and that's why I love the word inspiring or influencing, rather than uh, just telling them what to do. You can't tell kids what to mm-hmm. do anymore. Not in today's world. It won't. It doesn't work, unless you've been doing it since they were little and you haven't given up on that. You just muscled them through it. There are some kids that have just submitted, and they're just, they're just, they're little robots to you, and they're going to follow you no yeah. matter what. But now you haven't really created competent leaders that think for themselves. You've developed, um, you know, kids that now have relied on you to tell them exactly what to do for yeah, everything. Yeah, then it, it gets too, too much of, of being a follower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, now they're going to call you for everything rather than no. Let me see if I can figure this out on my own. Yeah. So you're not, th- you're not developing competent leaders. You're developing really good uh, followers. Yeah, and the word that came to mind, yeah, was invite them in a way to. Yeah, it's to a beautiful see whatever, word. Yeah. An invitation. I'm going to invite you. It's almost like when we started the show. I'm going to invite you into this dialogue. Be open to the possibility that these uh, are possible. That you can create value for yourself. That you can have aha moments. That by listening to the dialogue, you can go, "Oh, that makes sense," or "Ooh, I can see that," or "Man, I'm open to that." If you stay open and you're able to paint a picture or, or put words together to have somebody really think deeply or you challenge their thinking, now you're inviting them into a new possibility. You're influencing them to mm-hmm. think that way or to see the value in that way. Uh, but most parents don't operate from the inviting. We don't operate from the influencing or inspiring you to see it that way <laughs> because it takes a lot of work. I just want to tell you, and you just I want you it's to do the, it. It's the because I said That's so. That's right. Yeah, just do it because <laughs> I said so, and just trust that because I've been there, I know better. And you can't tell that to a kid that has is trying to figure out who they are, and they're trying to trust themselves and their own little voice and their own mm-hmm. intuition. And so, so you're you're bumping heads with somebody that is trying to uh, naturally develop into their own competent leader uh, for themselves. Number four is. They don't respect me. They no longer have respect for me. And so then they show up at, to me as a difficult child or a difficult teenager because mm-hmm. I've collected evidence that they no longer respect me. Rather than the perspective of I've not yet figured out how to gain back their trust. I haven't figured out how to gain back their trust. So if, if they've lost trust and respect in you, it would take for you to be willing to look at, man, at what point in this journey, in this relationship, did I lose that? Because I used to have it. Right, yeah. It was there, and then whatever the tipping point was, that's where you have to hone in on. Yeah, or, yeah but, or, but but the trick is for you to own your part. Rather than saying they no right, longer they no, yeah. you no longer respect me, 
they no longer trust me. Could you say how did I lose it? Yes, that's that's, that's, that's the that's this? the that's the you yeah. part the part that has you owning the part that you played, and you have to, and it takes a little bit of courage to be mm-hmm. willing to go. Man, where did I where did I lose it? Most parents that come and sit with me that have you know challenges with their kids that either don't trust them or lost respect. This seems to be one of the most challenging. It's just to get me is for me to get them to see at what point did you lose it? And they look at me like, huh? What do you mean? I, I, never, see, I, I never lost yeah. it. They, it yeah. they just decided like it was a, like just on their own that I have as a parent that I had no part in it. I was just doing my best and just parenting the best I could. And it was a byproduct of them deciding that they don't trust me and they don't, and that they lost respect rather than yeah, what part did I play in it where I could have said certain things certain way or kept my word more often or followed through with what I said or, um, you know, done the things that I said I was going to do, then maybe I wouldn't have gotten to the part where. Yeah, they, because they trust. kids don't wake up one day and like, you know what? I'm not going to respect my parents anymore. Right. Isn't that, <laughs> that, a, just doesn't isn't happen. that an aha moment? <laughs> yeah. But as a parent, sometimes we live in that illusion. Like, why, why not? Yeah. It, it, it just, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't just happen. It's right. a little bit of time. Slowly they lose this uh, trust uh, for you and your word and, that that um, you're still guiding them down that road and all that kind of stuff, and then it gets to a point where after the trust is worn out, then they start to lose the respect and the respect starts to slip off. I'll tell you what, when we come back from the break, we'll uh, get back into the rest of the list. Stay tuned for more of the Alex Rabina Radio Show right here in your hometown station, KHTS. Santa Clarita, bedbugs are taking over our city. They've invaded our homes, our businesses, and most importantly, our sleep. If you have suspicious bites that appear nightly or have a bug that you need ID, your best option is to make one call to All Pro. We offer a 100% guarantee that your bedbug issues will be solved with heat in one treatment. No need to tent or spray your house with chemicals. Heat is all you need. Call 661-298-2200 or text me a bug picture to 661-645-0540. It's time to sleep tight again, SCV. La Esmeralda is home to truly authentic Mexican food. This family-owned restaurant prides itself on its fresh-to-order menu. Even the tortillas are made in-house. If you have a taste for sizzling fajitas, flautas, or menudo, you have to try La Esmeralda's Mexican and seafood restaurant. Dine in or order out for the most authentic Mexican food Santa Clarita has to offer. Their Taco Tuesdays, it'll turn you into a regular. La Esmeralda on Bouquet at Haskell. The popular Summer Beach Bus is back. The city of Santa Clarita is now offering rides to Santa Monica Beach on Saturdays and Sundays now through September 1st. Forget dealing with traffic or money for parking. Ride to the beach with ease on one of the city's comfortable air-conditioned commuter express buses. Bring your beach chairs, coolers, and surfboards. Fares are only $3 each way for children and adults, $1.50 each way for seniors 60 years or older, and persons with disabilities. For more information, visit SantaClaritaTransit.com. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? Because they strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia. They know you have high expectations. Their stellar team will meet and exceed those expectations. That's why they were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing them in the top 10% of all dealers. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for practically the same price as a Toyota or Honda. Details at mbzvalencia.com. That's mbzvalencia.com. Hometown, your hometown station. And welcome back to the Alex Rabina Radio Show, right here in your hometown station, KHCS. Today we are talking about why my teenagers seem to be so difficult. And we have been talking about the possibility that, one, they could be difficult because that's how you see them. Those are the lenses that you look through. You see them from the interpretation or the perspective that, man, you are difficult. And we already went through all the different reasons why. And we're not doubting that you've collected evidence that they... They're showing up in their behavior as difficult, but we want to point out a pic, you know, paint a picture for you of the possibility that that's just how you see them and that you could actually choose not to see them like that. If you chose to look through a different pair of glasses that takes responsibility for maybe the part that you've played in, um, in the 15, 16 years that they have been assigned to you in this lifetime and that you've been parenting them 
that at some point they did trust you and they did respect you and they did agree with you and do all the things and they were following your lead and that you have been a great leader. Um, what happened was at a certain point they have started to realize that they wanted to become their own leader and that they can think for themselves, which is just a natural progression in teenagers. Uh, we've all gone through it. It's almost like a rite of passage for us um, when we're young is to go, hey, I want – I got these wings. I want to start to figure out to see if I can fly on my own, which is what you want as a parent. You want your kids to start realizing for themselves that they can think for themselves so that they can flap those wings and fly out of your home and go on, create some, some success in their lives and uh, purchase their own homes and start their own families and then be the leader of their own families. You don't want to be uh, having robots that are always turning to you all the time. We, we want them to come to us as support. We want to support them, but not where they can't even think for themselves. And they're still living at home, you know, 45 years old. And, uh, and now you realize that you've created someone that has failed to launch and develop that kind of, uh, you know, courage and, and confidence and perseverance. So we were going down this list of the, the way that possibly through your eyes you see them as difficult and then I was creating a different possibility for you to look through different lenses where you take responsibility in that same scenario. And so let's just jump back into it. Number six, you could be looking through those eyes of what makes them difficult. Number six is they believe that they know better and have all the answers when they don't. Yeah, this plays more – this is relevant more than any other time in history because you have – the entire information in the world in your pocket. And they're quick to say, oh, I read this, or look it up. You say something like, no, this, this is the way, look, it says right here. That's how I, that's where I can see that being true uh, now more than any time because, yeah, they have the entire world and every lesson plan, every book on that, and then that's when they question it. And then they now they have evidence, quote, evidence to back it, whatever they're saying. Up. Yeah, yeah. So So they're very intelligent because of the Internet. And because the access to information is right at their fingertip, they've already read, you know, several articles or watched YouTube videos about whatever topic you want to discuss, you know, because of your own experience and your own wisdom, they're going to challenge you on it. But instead of instead of resorting to they believe that they know better and have all the answers when they don't, what would it look like if you operated or looked through the lenses of I've not yet figured out how to challenge their own beliefs and get them to reconsider that just because they understand a concept, that that concept's not as linear. So just because you understand a yep. concept of how something might go doesn't mean it's going to go <laughs> like exactly. that, right? It's like you can read a book about how to hammer a nail into a, a piece of wood, and you can read it for 10,000 years, and the minute they give you that nail and that hammer, and for the very first time, when you're now putting that practice into play, you've already smashed your thumb three or four times, if not broken a knuckle, because it, it didn't seem as simple. It wasn't right. as simple as it was when you read it, when you, when you, when you mm -hmm. did the research. And life isn't as linear. Life throws uh, curveballs at you. Life throws challenges at you. And so just because you think you understand the concept or you have your life mapped out and all figured out and you already know how what your blueprint to success is going to look like, kids today, they they really believe that, no, it's going to go as linear as I've read it. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go with no bumps, and it's going to go exactly the way that I envision it. But what about the, the, the parenting and the, well, let them fail so they – know that it's not that way. I love I love that concept. In fact, I subscribe to that same theory, which is, okay, if that's how you see it, now it's time to get out there and let's put it to, to the test and let's create some kind of challenge for you to go after and simulate that so that you can see if that theory works for you or not. And then you have to let them sink or swim. What most of us parents don't want to do is let them sink. So what we do is yeah, we naturally. jump in. So we jump in and we save them. So as soon as they st start to get rough and they start to sink and start to drown, we jump in and we save them, and then they go, "See, I, I, I figured it out." And yeah, then, I was and, right this whole and, time. Yeah, and you're going, no, <laughs> "No, no, 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 I saved you." And then they're like, "No, you." And then that just starts. Yeah, the whole... yeah, yeah. So, so you got to be open to the possibility. That a lot of times when our kids are struggling or suffering. 
as parents, we don't want our kids to go through that because we've gone through it and we wish somebody saved us. But we don't realize when we jump in and save somebody from struggle, we're robbing them from the opportunity to learn something about themselves. Grit, perseverance, confidence, the ability to adapt and overcome. We rob them from learning all of those natural um, inner qualities that they can develop because we jump in and we pull them out before they can even have that awakening. And then we wonder why we don't have competent young leaders as kids that can go out there and, and, and face challenge and face adversity and think outside the box and be creative enough to find solutions and, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it makes yeah. sense. And now I'm just thinking about every scenario where uh, my peers would not know how to do certain things. And it, it's been it's been in, in talks a while. Um, change a tire, for instance, or um, do even, even cook, you know, simple things like that. Because some other uh, person, usually their parents, would do it for them. Or just say, not not the parents wouldn't say, oh, you can figure it out. And so what we've, dis- what we've disguised that as parents, we've disguised it as, but be- I do it because I love them. Right. Like, well, why not? Like, yeah, exactly. And if I love you, I don't want to see you in pain. I don't want to see you suffering. I don't want to see you struggle. So I'm going to jump in and save you from that because I love you so much. Rather than uh, my love for you has nothing to do with struggling and uh, suffering and struggling and suffering isn't a bad thing. Struggling and suffering to some degree has life lessons to be taught. Those are opportunities for you as a young man, as a young woman, to try to figure out who you are. Those moments where you're struggling and not knowing how you're going to uh, pay the light bill or um, how you're going to eat tonight and all those. As long as it's within reason, those little struggles are huge life lessons for you to learn about life in general, about you yourself, about what you're capable of. And you won't be able to get challenged and be able to access that champion inside of you unless you're put to that kind of a test. And so I think as parents, we jump in and we Mm. save you from, and we rob you from those beautiful life altering moments where we realize how truly competent we are and how we can be. And how can you gauge that from the the parent's perspective of, of course, if if your kid calls you for something, don't automatically say, no, go figure it out. But then you do it one time. But then how many, you know what I mean? When is it too too much? Or when can you say, no, figure it out? That's a great question. I actually have this um, segment in my book. And I talk about where I, you know, kind of out myself and say, as a Generation X, uh, I, when I have my, started having my own, parenting challenges with my kids and wanting to give them everything I didn't have or be there for them a thousand percent of the time, I had to force myself to say no to things more often than not. And I knew I wasn't strong enough. So what I did was I created a rule and it's called the three, the three, two rule. So for every, uh, two times that I say yes, or let's say for in every five scenarios where I'm requested support or I need your help, I would say yes to two, and I would force myself to say three no's so that I wasn't off balance. Yeah. Because because mm-hmm. in default, for my, for my loving heart, when my kid asks me for something, I want to say you know, yes to five. I want to do right? five out of five. Yeah. It's just in my nature because those are, those are my kids. Like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, I don't want you to suck. You know what I mean? So by default, that part of me that, that wants to go in and save them, it wants to say yes to everything. So I'd have to force myself to go, no, sorry, you, you got yourself into that. You got to figure it out. And then I would get a, 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 a rag and I would bite into it. And I'd have to go through, you know, letting them struggle and suffer and figure that out. And because of that rule, um, more often than not, my kids would have to dig down deep and figure out how to find that champion within, within them and then develop some creativity within themselves to figure out how to get themselves out of those situations. Now, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But what I was doing was I was prepping them for what I called the real world. Because when you get out of my home, daddy's not going to be there to save <laughs> yeah. you all the time. I'm not going to be able to be you know, close enough to you to go pick you up at 3 in the morning because you have a flat tire. 
you're going to have to figure that out on your own. You're going to have to get creative enough to handle your circumstances. So what I was prepping them to do was to develop enough confidence and competent, uh, some competency at a higher level that they can handle any circumstance that arises. Um, and they're still in their journey. And as much as they're still in their journey in their early 20s, I'm still in my journey to still not go right. and bail them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it just kind of flips, I guess. I'm know, still sense. in it. I'm still challenging myself. And even, you know, 23, 25, 30, still stopping going, no, you need to figure this out to some degree to where I don't become what's called an enabler. I don't want to be I don't ever want to be a master enabler because then now I have codependent kids that are relying on me, relying on me 24/7 and I might not be here forever. And you got to figure out how to stand on your own and be your own leader and figure out things for yourself so that you can now be that kind of a mom for your kids and then you can be that kind of a dad for your kids. But if not, if I enable you now, what are you going to do to your kids? Right, the exact same thing. You're going to enable them. You're going to enable, before you know it, three generations. Now I got bratty, um, <laughs> you know, uh, kids that are, are, are now, you know, wanting everything and throwing temper tantrums. All the way right. down the line. And then I, you're going to say, why are my kids difficult? And then we're back. <laughs> we're back all over again. Instead of me taking responsibility for going, no, what's the part that I yeah. play or have played in it? And so it's just from coming from a mindful place of I get to go, no, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that grandfather with bratty little grandkids because my son or my daughter ha- doesn't know how to jump in and say with a hel- from a healthy place, no, sorry, you got to figure this out. And I think a lot of times as as parents, we we hate saying no to our kids. Why do you think as parents or even you as a, as a human being yeah. hate to say no to a friend or a sister or a mom? You know what I mean? It's like why, why do we struggle with just saying no? Uh, it's de- definitely difficult. But for me, it's just I obviously want to be liked and be fr- friends with everybody and be loved. And saying no uh, right off the bat first puts a negative connotation on it where like, no, I don't want you pretty much in my life or ask me for anything ever again. But it's not that. It's just at that time. But for me, like saying no, uh, I have the feeling of I'm saying no to you as a person, not just no to that request. Like, yeah, I want you to like me, love me, be my friend, whatever it is. No, it's it's de- it's yet. definitely dependent on being liked, being loved, being approved of because God forbid – that person decide that they don't love you, they can't count on you. That seems to be like the end, the end of us. So here's a great example. So the, the, the new mom that has a newborn child, child sleeps in their crib, you know, for the first couple of years until they become a toddler. When they're a toddler, they're so used to crying in the middle of the night and the mom's so used to grabbing the kid and bringing the kid into their bed with the mom and dad and now they're all don't get no sleep because the kids squirming and you know sleeping sideways and all that kind of stuff so this is the first time and this is a scenario that i that i just thought of but so the woman the the mom and the dad have to decide okay honey um maybe it's time that we let him or her cry a little bit longer so that they get used to sleeping in their bed and that we don't send a message saying every time you cry we're going to come and bail you out but if we if we bite if we all bite on a rag and get past that 20 minutes of crying hour of crying and we can get past that pain of what we think our kids are suffering and we get past that well the son or daughter or the baby will just develop uh, grit and perseverance and they'll cry themselves to sleep to where they just start a new behavior pattern where they're just sleeping in their bed throughout the whole night and 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 I know, Mom, if you have children in your past, you know what this experience is like. Because some, some moms will go, no, it kills me to hear my kid crying yeah, it's past the, five like minutes. Let him cry. Well, yeah, but here's why they won't. Most moms won't let their kids cry, and I'm sure dads too, because it validates a belief that they, have, that they might have in, within them that, that I'm a bad mom. That I'm a bad dad if my son or daughter cries to the point where I feel like I got to go in and save them. Rather than deciding, no, it's okay for you to cry. It's healthy. It's part of the process. But if I hang in there long enough, you'll cry yourself to sleep and we'll start a whole new pattern. 
and then you get to be a big boy, big girl, and sleeping in your bed by yourself. Rather than you're seven years old and you still come in, and <laughs> you're seven or eight years old and you're still sleeping with mom and dad, and the grandma and grandpa are going, "What's going on? Yeah, here? What? <laughs> yeah. what? What's going on? Like, how, how did how did you get past that stage where your son or daughter never really learned how to sleep in their own bed, and it just becomes a part of the way we enable our kids and we jump in because of our own fears and our own insecurities of not being adequate enough or having you not like me or having you um, be mad at me that we jump in and we do things for people because we think we're helping them. But sometimes we're not really helping them. We're actually enabling them and we're making it easier for them to not learn whatever lesson they need to learn so they can step up to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. They got to fail. Simple as that. Fail is a good thing. Fail is a great thing. Because there's an opportunity for us to learn some things about ourselves. All right, stay tuned for more of the Alex Bina radio show right here in your hometown station, KHTS. The theater can be found right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The Canyon Theater Guild has been entertaining audiences for decades with top quality musicals and plays. Located on Main Street in Old Town Newhall, CTG also offers workshops for the young actor in your family. For more information, call the box office at 799-2702 or go online to canyontheater.org. We all know sometimes people lose their way. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, The Way Out Recovery SCV may have the answers you've been waiting for. The Way Out is the premier intensive outpatient treatment center serving Santa Clarita. Asking for help is the first step. Call The Way Out today, 661-296-4444. That's 296-4444 for a private free assessment. The Way Out is an accredited, affordable outpatient program that accepts most insurance. Call us at 661-296-4444 or check us out online at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. Quit battling with yourself. Ask The Way Out for help today. This is a Rita's Daybreak. There's a huge crowd at Rita's with so many amazing flavors. Every day's a treat. Let's see what folks are celebrating. I lost my first tooth. No more training wheels. My dog photo got 37 likes. Three kids, three activities, zero meltdowns. There you have it. Layer it, blend it, or drink it with Italian ice and creamy custard. So many reasons to celebrate at Rita's. This has been a Rita's Daybreak. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome to the Alex Urbina Radio Show. The following is paid programming and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHTS or its ownership. And welcome back to the Alex Urbina Radio Show right here in your hometown station, KHTS. If you're just joining us or miss any part of the show, you might want to go back and um, revisit from the beginning. We had two different segments that uh, what we're talking about today is why teenagers seem to be so difficult. And what we uh, open up this possibility that they could be difficult because or showing up difficult to you because that's how you see them in the first place. So it starts with your perspective that if I see my child as being difficult because I'm comparing them how they are now to how they used to be when they were younger. Well, first of all, there is two different worlds. There was a, a pre a leadership awareness and competence of themselves when they were little kids. They relied on you for everything. You were their mentor, their guide, their leader, their God, king or queen. You were basically in charge of telling them what to do. The minute that started to shift is when they were five or six. For some, it's seven or eight. And it's the moment that they realize, hmm, I have my own brain, I have my own mind, my own awareness to think for myself, I have my own voice, I discover my own voice so I can say, this is the first time they, they, they start to challenge you and go, no, right? When they're four or five years old, you're like, hey, go clean your room. No. Like, no. You're like, what did you just what? say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's going on around here? You know, parents, you, you remember what that was like when they started to challenge you and they, they've been challenging you since they were little, but now it's at a stage uh, that's more heightened because uh, they're starting to get more confident in themselves, more assured. So they're going to challenge you. And 
in that moment is very easy for you to stay stuck in the you used to be like that and now you're not anymore so therefore i see you as being difficult rather than this is just the natural progression of where you're at and i'm going to choose to not see you difficult and i'm going to choose to take responsibility for the things that i should have been learning as a parent to get ahead of uh, the learning curve to teach you and to continue to be that leader and guide which is pretty amazing if you think about it so i'll just you know, I'll put myself on the chopping block as a parent. If my son or daughter, you know, as I'm le- being their leader, right, they're, th- they're two years old, they're five, they're six. If I stop growing as a leader and stop developing and stop evolving both spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally, if I'm not consciously growing, then at a certain point, my kids outgrow me. So now there are these uh, millennials or Generation I that has a lot of technology and they they just become intellectually smarter and they got more uh, insight when it comes to information, not necessarily wisdom when it comes to real world stuff, but now they all of a sudden they're challenging me. (laughs) And if I stop growing as a parent, this is where you have the parents that get like, they're they're like, oh my God, my son or daughter is like, I'm in trouble. And this is where you reach out for help, get a counselor, therapist, a coach, you start putting, sending them to camps, to boot camps, because they all of a sudden they've, they're not doing and they're not listening to me the way that they used to be. What happened? Mm-hmm. What happened was you missed the awakening and the awareness at a certain point, uh, the, 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 the call to action for you to keep growing and evolving and developing your parenting skills. When you ask parents how much time or money or commitment or dedication or investment do you put in your, your parenting skills and, and learning as a parent? Most parents will look at you like, huh? What are you I, talking like, about? I'm a good parent as it is right yeah, now. Yeah, what are you talking about? I, I, haven't put no, I haven't put no money into it. I haven't put no investment. I haven't taken no classes. I don't read no books. <laughs> and, you yeah. go, and you go, okay, well, some of you got lucky. You got good kids because, you know, just in their DNA or good genes or – or something about you as a, you're just a beautiful human being. They picked up on some of those things. You modeled that. Um, so kudos to you. But there, then there are some parents that just are going to struggle because they haven't been wanting to learn. They weren't. They didn't have the wake up call or the awareness. No one was over their shoulder. They didn't have a dad or a mom to go, "Hey, honey, if you know he's five or six now, and if he's challenging you like that, you're going to have to do some development mm-hmm. in yourself because that kid when he gets and I've heard of some. I've heard of some grandparents say that to their kids. Like if he's, if he's challenging you or at four years old, like you're going to have to get on the ball and start learning how to get ahead of him. You're going to have to not let this kid out evolve you. Cause if he out evolves you, he's going to be running the show. She's going to be telling you what to do and, and uh, you know, and, and learning how to manipulate you and play you and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to think as a parent, sometimes we just, we rest on our laurels and we think that just, because I, they were born to me and I had them since they were little that they're going to follow my instructions. It's like bringing a little baby cub from, from Africa. <laughs> and it's like, oh, how cute. And it's like, no, we've bonded and we love each other and he'll never bite me. <laughs> it's going to grow up to be a lion. <laughs> and when that lion is huge <laughs> and you smack it in the head and it, out of instinct, bites your arm off and you're in the hospital and all your loved ones are like, yo, like we told you. And you're like, ah, you know. Yeah, I just thought it would be fine by itself, just yeah, how it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, I'm painting you know a picture that I don't want to scare you, but mm-hmm. I want to paint this picture of the possibility that your kids are gonna they're gonna be challenging you. Um, and so, what it takes is for you to take an honest look at yourself and ask yourself: may, Is there room for me to continue to grow, to continue to evolve, both? spiritually emotionally mentally um to develop ability to articulate articulate myself in a specific way so my son or daughter doesn't um get offended or um feel like they're being spoken down to are there some tools that i can develop within myself that helps me establish myself as a mentor uh, as a guide as someone that they turn to when they're struggling, when they need help? Or have I ruined the relationship to a certain point because I'm unwilling to grow 
that they now no longer respect me, that they do think that they have life all figured out, and they've already convinced themselves that there's no, nothing, mom, dad, that you can offer me anymore because right. I'm already at that stage. Yeah, and that's the major. That's pretty much the crux of what teenagers now speaking for teenagers, but but want is just that acknowledge me as not as your child necessarily, but as another human being that's living this world. Yes, help me and assist me, but don't tell me exactly what to do because then it's my own ideas. If I come to you with an idea, uh, it could be totally wrong, and you know it. But let them figure it out by talking it through and saying, okay, what's your plan for this and that and the other, and then they can see it for themselves. I think that's much greater uh, than it'll help out. And we'll have um, make your child away from that difficult child so you won't have that that difficult child, as you say, but but help them see the way rather than just that no. Because that no, and then that's going to lead to a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, and working with teenagers for a little over 24 years, it seems like that's really what the cries have been in the training rooms when I really sit down and talk to them. What they're all really yearning for is a new kind of relationship with their parents. They They, they want to have you mom, dad, see them in a different way rather than that little kid um, that you used to just tell them what to do. It's almost like they're demanding for you to shift your perspective and see them as uh, having the capacity and the ability to be competent even though they haven't figured it out yet. They still want Mm -hmm. you to interact with them as though you can, that they can be that. And then they want you to be more encouraging, more inviting, um, more influential rather than that old autocratic style of parenting, which is do as I say and, and or belittling yeah. them because, see, I told you if you would have <laughs> done it my way. You know what I mean? That, yeah. All those – all that racket doesn't work for kids in today's world. might have wor- worked back it, when I was growing up. You can, you can use that, and it worked. Yeah, they're not, they're not going out saying, I want to be a difficult child. Let me see how I can be a difficult – no, they're just growing, and you, the parent – or the person are putting that difficultness, uh, difficulty label on them, and then there that's where growth stops. If that's what the dynamic is. Yeah, and like you said, when you when you talk about it like a label, it's like if you've decided in your perspective, in your current perspective, that my son is or or daughter's difficult, you put the label and you put them in what's called like I call it a box. You put them in a box, or you put a label on them that's decided that they are difficult, and once they're difficult. From that current perspective, there's no way you can cause a, sh- a shift because they're always going to show up to you as difficult. But if you're willing to say, you know what, my son or daughter is just showing up the way they're showing up, and that's an opportunity for me to look at who I need to be or who, what growth I need to create for myself or how, what do I need to reinvent myself. Your son or daughter is always showing you the work that you still need to be done for yourself as a parent. Take that to heart. And I uh, appreciate you guys listening in. Thanks for always tuning in here with me on the Alex Rabina Radio Show, right here in your hometown station, KHTS.